So good afternoon. Um, my name is Lars Hansen. I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of the uh, Economics Department, the Becker Friedman Institute, and the Chicago and the France Chicago Center. Today I have the great privilege and opportunity to introduce Jean Tirol, the most recent recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Jean Tirol is, the, is at the U Toulouse University and serves as a scientific director of the, uh, of the Institute for Industrial Organization. Jean has made wide-ranging, important contributions to a remarkable variety of fields, including industrial organization, corporate finance, game theory, and decision theory. In at least two of these areas, he has literally written the book on the subject. He is an innovative thinker, carefully crafting formal arguments in support of novel and enduring ideas. Jean Tirole received his PhD in economics from MIT after previously receiving an engineering degree from Ecole Polytechnique and a doctoral in decision mathematics from the University of Paris 4. Please join me in, uh, in welcoming Jean. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Lars, for those kind words, and thanks for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, so I'm going to give the lecture that I gave for, uh, for the Nobel lecture, um, and I have to put it in context a little bit. Uh, the first thing is they ask you, and I guess they ask Lars as well, is to talk about the topic of the price, not about your latest paper or or the meaning of life, you have to talk precisely about the topic of the price, and I'll also ask you to explain how you came to think about those things, and that's also a hard, hard part. So you'll get some of that today, uh, and then we'll talk also about industrial organizations. So just as a matter of introduction, uh, let me just say that traditionally economists have extolled the, the virtues of markets, uh, and not only Chicago economists, you know, more generally economists have liked market because they uh, they protect consumers from the uh, political influence of lobbies and they force uh, producers to deliver products and services at cost. Unfortunately, competition is rarely pa perfect, markets fail. And market power, which is the ability of firms to raise price above cost substantially or to offer low quality, must be kept in check. Industrial organization studies the exercise and control of market power. And to do that, it basically captures, uh, it tries to capture the essence of the prime, and then uh, try to write a model and, if possible, test it uh, through econometric techniques, if you have enough data, or possibly in the lab or in the field. And in the end, you have to assess the reasonableness of the assumptions, uh, the robustness to those assumptions, and also the fit of the data, and then you feel more confident in giving advice to public decision makers on changing regulation or to private businesses on the design of their, their business model. Industrial organization has a very long tradition, and uh, the first, and being French, I have to, to cite, uh, to cite uh, French engineer economists. We call them people who have been trained in engineering and became economists, and there have been a bunch of them including two of my heroes, uh, Cournot and Dupuis. And then after that, there, were, there was a lot of policy orientation with uh, enactment of the Sherman Act in 1890 uh, and subsequent legislation. Then there was this uh, very descriptive school, which was called the Harvard School, uh, or Structure, Conduct, Performance Paradigm, which was very influential in antitrust. And finally, skeptical, uh, with the Chicago School, and here are a couple of people, but there's this much broader school, uh, which basically cast doubt on the whole edifice by saying there are no theoretical foundation, the logic is not great, and that was a very useful uh, switch. Now, it's fair to say that at the time, the Chicago School was a little bit suspicious of uh, regulation, so it didn't really elaborate on an alternative paradigm, as it sometimes did. Um, now, I should say, by the late 70s or early 80s, basically antitrust economics and regulation theory was kind of in shambles and had to be rebuilt. And there's been a modern intellectual corpus that came out of it and that has emerged as a part of collective effort, not only you know, with my collaborators, and uh, here are some, and it's a small subset of those 
with whom I've had a chance to collaborate, but there are many people in the field uh, who have uh, deeply influenced my thinking, so it's really a collaborative effort and it's a collaborative prize. So in, in a sense, my being on the spotlight uh, last October and last December was also more to their contribution to my own talent. Um, but, you know, the, the general environment is a conference we organized in Toulouse. That was the first conference we organized in Toulouse. And you will recognize many of the big names in this organization there. Um, but I claim credit for one thing, which is that to, to have been in good places and at the right time, so to be in a, an intellectual environment where I would learn a lot from my colleagues and students and basically benefit from that. It's true for the field for which a prize was awarded, but for the fields as well. Now, I had a bit, actually a huge amount of luck. Uh, it started uh, when I was a student at MIT, and one day in the corridor, a fellow classmate of mine, Eric uh, Drew Fudenberg, who was also an advisor of Eric Maskin, told me about a field which was called industrial organization. I said, industrial what? And, then, you know, and he said, no, no, this is very interesting. You don't know about it. Uh, you should listen to it. At that point of time, I'd taken my journals already. Uh, so I sat in a class which was given by Paul Josko and Dick Schmanzi, and I found that really, really interesting. But that was pure luck. Um, at the time also, there were breakthroughs in game theory and information economics, and that was very, very important. I see Roger Meissen in the room, and there was a whole group of people uh, at the time, uh, you know, some at Northwestern, some at uh, Stanford, and some everywhere else as well. And there were big breakthroughs that made game theory information economics much more, much more practical and was very good in order to build the foundations for industrial organization. On the policy front, there was widespread recognition that all style public utility regulation, which basically insulated firms from their cost performance, was uh, led to inflated cost and basically has to be changed. So that wasn't, the performance was not very good. And to crown it all, institutional change favor the use of economics. So for example, in Europe, uh, decision and you know, regulatory design was basically decided in ministries and it was basically a political process. You will go to the, you know, to, the office, uh, uh, to, to the office of the minister and you will discuss things. There will be no economic argument left uh, discussed. But you know, then there were independent agencies which were created for antitrust and regulation. And of course, if they are independent, you get much more discussion of, of economics. So that was actually very good in order to get uh, um, attention to economics. Now, this most fortunate conjunction of circumstances led to a new paradigm. Uh, if you read the scientific committee background report, which is a lot of work that those people work very hard, it's a paradigm which is very rich and complex. First, you just cannot count the number of firms to know whether a market is competitive or not. Um, and also, every industry has its specificities. I mean, that's, that's both the beauty and also the difficulty of industrial organization. So if you think about um, payment cards, information technology, innovation, railroads, or cement, yeah, those are completely different markets, and you have to think uh, deeply about why they are different. So economists accordingly have advocated a case-by-case uh, case case approach or rule-of-reason approach to antitrust away what, from what's called rigid per se rules. So per se rule is a behavior, is allowed or prohibited, period. You don't think about whether it's good or bad. It's just allowed or prohibited. And of course, um, we, I mean, you know, sometimes you think there are good reasons, like price fixing arrangements. But, you know, it was a whole range of other things as well. And you just say, why, why is that? I mean, why, why do we have those rules? Maybe they have efficiency. You know, those practices may have efficiency reasons, and we should think about that. But of course, um, you know, this rule of reason approach is dangerous as well, because that means, you know, everything goes. And we economists have, have a, a, a duty, a social duty, to develop a rigorous analysis of how market works. And you have to account for the specificity of, of the industries. And you have to account, and that's very important, I'll come back to that, for what regulators do and do not know. So you would like to have kind of information light rules 
uh, which do not require too much information from the regulators, or at least do not use information that the regulators are unlikely to, to possess. Okay? Um, the other thing is that the economists must participate in the policy debate. The financial crisis actually is a case in point. I mean, if you look at the financial crisis and the various ingredients, actually most of them were in the economics literature. Now, we didn't do a good job at evangelizing the, those things. Uh, we were remote, so even when we knew, we didn't know exactly the exact number of cross, you know, for the cross exposure or the special vehicle, uh, investment vehicle, special purpose vehicles and so on. Uh, we didn't pay attention, and, uh, and that's, that's correct. But of course, you know, the responsibilities there must go both ways. The economists must talk and explain what they are doing, but it must also be the case that the media and the politicians listen to economists. So it's, uh, it goes both ways. So let me start with uh, restriction, the re restraining market power to the benefit of consumers. Now, as a general rule, regulators affect industries in multiple ways. So if you take uh, sectoral regulators in telecoms, electricity, railroads, or postal services, the network industries, they regulate incumbent uh, operators' rate of return, and they monitor the condition under which those incumbents give access to their rivals, to the bottlenecks they control. Antitrust authorities allow and validate horizontal as well as vertical mergers and agreements, and they decide whether certain behaviors and contractual covenants constitute an abuse of dominant position. Patent and trademark offices and courts grant, uphold, or reject a patent and de determine its scope, its breadth, whether the grantee can seek an injunction, and so forth. Ultimately, if you think about those different forms of regulations, they have in common that regulators face a trade-off between lowering the prices for the users, and then that guarantees wider diffusion, and granting a fair rate of return to the firm. So consider, for example, the foreclosure doctrine in its modern form. In that figure there, an upstream firm you has a unique access to what's called an essential facility, an essential infrastructure, a bottleneck input, whatever you want to call it. That is some input that cannot be reproduced or bypassed by others at a low cost. So think of that as a railroad tracks and station network, a power transmission grid, a key patent. Okay? The competition policy issue is whether the upstream firm should give equal or fair access to all the downstream uh, suppliers. So think of them as being alternative train operators, power producers, technology implementers. So I call them D1, DN in the figure. Or whether the bottleneck owner, the upstream firm U, uh, can basically foreclose access to the bottleneck and, and, and do other things, okay? Now, the idea is that this fair access will allow downstream firms to compete with each other and there will be a level playing field, okay? Now, what I'm going to argue is that you need to think twice. So your gut feeling is that fair access is a good thing. But I'm going to show you that the devil is in the detail. Okay. Now, assume, to start with, that you can have bilateral negotiations between the upstream supplier and each individual downstream firm. Now, what I'm going to argue is that downstream competition then is going to dissipate the profit that can be extracted from end users. Just to see that intuitively, Suppose that the downstream competitors sell a homogeneous product with a demand curve Q equals D of P, or the inverse demand curve P equals P of Q. Imagine that production upstream and production downstream is costless, and that downstream firms transform one unit of input into one unit of output. That's really the simplest situation you can have in mind. The question is whether, by controlling the bottleneck, the upstream firm is able to deliver, obtain, capture the monopoly profit pi m, which maximizes, given that there is no cost, uh, q times p of q, which is the revenue. Um, so can you get uh, this, uh, upstream, this uh, monopoly profit from this industry if you are engaged in bilateral negotiations with, 
um, each downstream form? And the answer is no. The answer is no. And to understand that, look at an individual negotiation between the upstream monopolist and a given downstream firm, DI. Imagine that DI anticipates some quantity supplied uh, by U to the other downstream suppliers. Let's call that Q minus I, which is the sum of the quantity which is sold um, to the others. Okay? Then if you look at um, the joint profit of the upstream firm and DI, so in the bilateral negotiation they care only about the joint profit, then they are going to choose a quantity to be supplied by U to DI, which maximizes QI, which is this quantity, times a price that will prevail in the downstream market, which is a price uh, which depends on total quantity supply. Remember that you supply, when you supply one unit of input, that becomes one unit of output. I could, I could motivate that more. And you get QI minus Q minus I. This is nothing but what Cournot in 1838 called the Cournot reaction curve. So anticipating some output by the others, well, you want to, to have your optimal. So some of you, and I take it many of you have done economics before, you, you have seen the Cournot model, you are going to get exactly the n firm Cournot equilibrium. So the n firm Cournot equilibrium is something which doesn't allow you, and let's say it's only one firm downstream, it doesn't allow you to enjoy the monopoly profit. Okay? Now, and the reason for that is a very simple externality. You co it's contracting with externality. So when you and DI decide to put one more unit, to supply one more unit, they don't take into account the fact that it's going to reduce the price and it's going to hurt the other firms, downstream firms. They don't care in their bilateral relationship. Okay? So you're going to get the N-firm Cournot equilibrium. In particular, if N is large, then the situation is going to, go, to get worse and worse. There's more and more profit dissip dissipation. Actually, if N goes to infinity, the profit will be, will be zero. There will be no profit despite the fact that you have a monopoly. Okay. Now, in practice, um, so w what I was saying is that bilateral negotiation is going to, uh, oops, bilateral negotiations are going to jeopardize the capture of monopoly profit by the upstream monopolist. So the upstream mo monopolist is victim of its own inability to commit. Okay. Now, what's, what's happening, of course, in practice, you know, firms have understood that for a long time. So in practice, what they do is actually uh, either to integrate vertically with a downstream unit, like D1 in this figure. In that case, of course, um, when you want to supply to the other downstream units, you take into account the fact that you are going to have a big externality on your downstream unit. So you're not going to do that. A vertical integration is going to be a way of avoiding the profit dissipation. Now, you are going to basically not supply the other firms, or you're going to not give them licenses to your patent, or you're going to charge them a very high excess price for access to the bottleneck. Okay. The other possibility is that you don't integrate vertically, but you, have, you enter a sweet deal agreement with this uh, downstream, downstream firm D1. Either way, you are going to, um, to, um, to foreclose the market to the other firms. So an example might be you might be a, um, a biotech company who is going to develop a new molecule for a new drug, and D1 will be big pharma, so, for example, Sanofi and Genzyme. And what's going to happen is that the biotech company will uh, give the rights uh, to the exploitation of the new drug for the product approval, production, marketing stages to, be, to only one big pharma. So it's going to foreclose the market for the others. Now, antitrust authorities may not like that because, the, of course, D2, DN, are going to complain they have no access to the essential facility, to the bottleneck. And you might put yourself in the shoes of a well-meaning antitrust society who's going to say, no, we don't have a level playing field. We'd like to have some competition downstream. And imagine, imagine that this antitrust society says, I want a non-discriminatory deal. 
So any deal that you're offering to D1, you have to offer to the other downstream firms. So that, imagine that you're an antitrust. Sounds good, right? You say, well, you know, uh, non-discriminatory, that's a level playing field. That's what we want. Okay? What do you do by doing that? You allow the upstream firm actually to enjoy its monopoly profits. So actually, you make things worse by being well-meaning. Okay? <laughs> Why is that? I mean, for example, what you can do is you can offer to D1 one end of the monopoly output at the, pri at the, at the price at the, against the transfer, which is basically the profit that will be made uh, to, by D1. So, and, but you offer the same thing to everybody else. And then it's no discrimination because you're offering the same contract to everyone. Of course, it has to be monitored publicly. Um, and then you get the monopoly price profit. Or you can say, I'm, going, I'm giving you access at marginal cost, which is zero. Here. You can buy as much as you want, but then you have to pay me a fixed fee, which is equal to the monopoly profit. And obviously, only one downstream firm will accept that because uh, if they were two, then they would lose money. They could never recoup the monopoly profit individually. So, so that's, not, that's not doable. So the interesting thing is that your gut feeling that actually you should have non-discrimination is actually pretty bad because actually you enable the monopolist to capture the monopoly profit whereas you were trying to facilitate the diffusion of the innovation or, or the bottleneck input to thing. Okay? So where do we stand? Um, so, whether the antitrust authority tolerates exclusionary behavior or not, it de facto regulates the rate of return of the uh, upstream infrastructure. And then you have to ask yourself, do we want the upstream infrastructure to make money on, on its monopoly position or not? Okay. So should the authority uh, clamp down on exclusionary behavior? And the common sense answer, uh, which is going to, I'm going to come to, hinges on the answer to the following question. Does the bottleneck result from an investment, an innovation, or is this associated with political connections, wrong market design, or Shillock? I mean, you know the answer, right? So simply, is there an investment worth of a reward or not? So for example, the beneficiary of highway, harbor, or airport concession deserves its money power if the monopoly position was acquired through a competitive, well-designed auction but not if it was acquired free of charge or through a biased auction. An inventor should be allowed to exploit the innovation himself or herself or grant an exclusive license if the innovation is major, but not if the innovation lacks novelty or is obvious, but is nonetheless protected by intellectual property law because patent was granted. A public, sorry, a public utility uh, should earn reasonable profit on investment, but not benefit from lucky cost and demand conditions. For example, it should not be able to benefit from a fall in the market price of a key input while being able to renegotiate the contract if the price shoots up. Okay. The same reasoning actually underlies much of the antitrust doctrine, which following Schumpeter doesn't frown upon monopoly power. You know, we know from Schumpeter that monopoly power is fine, but it frowns upon the further acquisition of market power through merger or abuse of dominant position. Okay. Now, you have to be careful. You know, this, this thing seems common sense. It's completely obvious. But in practice, it's pretty difficult to know. So think about the software industry, for example. In the software industry, often you have a, you have a dominant firm in any given segment. You know, there are big network externalities, return to scope, return to scale, and you end up with a dominant, you know, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, whatever. You, you tend to have kind of a dominant format and you gain a point of time. Now, you know, it may be the case that actually there was a big investment in promoting network externalities and market power is deserved. Or it might be pure luck because the users coordinated on this platform which was no better than the others. Uh, and, of course, it's very hard to know. For the economists, you don't always know which, which obtains. Now, that brings me to the issue of information asymmetries, which are a very important issue. 
Regulators face a double asymmetry of information, called adverse selection and more hazard. First, regulated firms have superior knowledge about their environment, their technology, the cost of their inputs, the demand for their products and services. Second, they are going to take actions that affect cost and demand. So you're going to invest in human resource management, strategic choices, R&D and brand image, uh, quality control, and so forth. Now, in the simplest version, think about the cost function. We are just going to look at the cost side. But basically, the cost of the firm will be a function of a parameter, or maybe a vector of parameters, beta, which are known only by the firm. So the regulator has a handicap, an informational handicap. Then there will be some effort, E, which is exerted by, by the firm to reduce the cost. Again, E could be a multidimensional parameter. And then there will be a, a vector of final outputs, Q equals Q1, Qn, because in general, those firms are multi-product firms. And then there may be some noise, so there may be some unforeseen uh, shock to the cost. So think about this, and the regulator may be observing Q, may be observing total cost, but doesn't know beta, doesn't, doesn't know the adverse selection parameters, doesn't know the effort parameters, may, may not know the noise either. Now, authorities that neglect the asymmetry of information fail to de deliver effective cost-efficient regulations. And let me just take two examples as a digression of cases like that in which have nothing to do with market power. It's regulation of firms which may not have market power. So you have heard about common and control in environmental regulation. And it has been shown both theoretically but also mainly empirically that actually using common and control, very detailed regulation, actually increases the cost of some environmental target achievement uh, relative to a simple price mechanism, which is an economic approach. And the reason for that is very simple, is that uh, the authorities don't have the information which is necessary to implement command and control. So they're going to get it wrong. And that's why they should be using a price, either, for example, a carbon tax or a cap and trade mechanism. And we could discuss that at length because we have an important negotiation in Paris in December. And, uh, I'm a bit pessimistic over it, about it, unfortunately, but uh, that's life. Um, now, in France, we have a judicial control of, uh, of layoffs. So if you want to lay off a worker because of a redundancy or something like that, you cannot just do that or pay a layoff tax. You have to go to a judge, and the judge is going to decide whether this job is justified or not. Now. I have nothing against that in spirit, but the point is that the judge, I mean, you can talk to them, they actually have no clue about whether the, the job is satisfied or is, is justified or not. So it's, it's kind of a blind approach to it. And, you know, it's, in my view, it's a pretty inefficient way of doing things. But the point is that you, if you are a regulator, you have to take into account that there are pieces of information that you don't have. Okay? And the same principle also for industrial organization. Now, with, risk, with regard to market power, there are two broad principles. The first is completely obvious. If you want to reduce asymmetric information, you collect data. Um, but there are more subtle ways of doing it. So you can, for example, that's the foundation of benchmarking. You may want to benchmark the performance of your firm with that of other firms which operate in similar conditions in other markets. Another way to do it is auction. You auction off the right, the monopoly right to a firm. And in the auction, the firms reveal information about industry cost by competing with each other. Second principle is that one size doesn't fit all. One should let the regulated firm make use of its information. But before we get to this, imagine that you are in charge of dealing with a contractor. So you are the regulator in your charge of dealing with a contractor. And two familiar contracts probably will come to your mind. The first contract is you can offer to fully reimburse the contractor's cost, and then you'll pay some set payment over this cost. So you say, I'm, you tell me, I'm going to cover your cost, whatever it is, and then I'll pay you some payment on top of that. Such a contract is called a cost plus contract. If the taxpayer foots the bill, 
and a writ of return contract if the cost and reward are derived from revenue from end users. Second contract is you can fix the total payment and tell the firm that this payment will cover its return as well as its cost, whatever the latter turns out to be. So you say, I'm paying you X, and you know, that co will cover your cost and your reward, you'll be fully accountable for your cost. Um, such a contract is called a fixed price contract if the project is taxpayer finance, or a price cut contract if the project is user finance. Now, the, obviously, the two contracts differ in the strengths of the incentive provided to the contractor. The cost plus contract shelters the firm from fluctuation in its cost performance, while the fixed price contract makes the firm fully accountable for it. So, for example, in the case of a non marketing good, uh, look at the net return uh, for the firm. So, that's a net return. That's how much it, it lives with. Um, so T is equal to some number A minus B times C, where C is its cost realization. Okay, that's, that's an affine uh, reward scheme. So for cost plus, basically you are insured against the risk on cost and your perform cost performance, B equals zero. So you get some fixed amount of money regardless of, of your cost level. Uh, for a fixed price contract, B equals one. So that means that you know, if, if you save uh, one dollar in cost, then you cash one dollar. Okay. Now, more generally, B is called the power of the incentive scheme. Now, if you give a choice to firms between, say, a fixed price contract and a cost plus contract, then an inefficient firm, so the firm which has a bad beta parameter, is going to go for the protection of cost plus because it doesn't want to be responsible for its cost. It knows it's going to be high. But it's also, uh, therefore, will have low incentive to reduce cost uh, because it has chosen B equals zero. If you are very efficient, you would rather go for B equals one. You, you say, no, no, I want to bear my cost. I'm going to show you, and I'm going to get more money out of it. Of course, you know, A and B has, have to move in a certain way. Okay? So, in general, you will want to to give a menu, that's the first thing that you can get. Now, raising the power of incentives, so if you look at in the old time, until the 80s, more, more or less we had, not everywhere, but we, you had B equals zero. So basically you said, you know, we'll reimburse your costs. I mean, for utilities like telecoms or electric utilities, what happened is that you, you just, you know, adjust it with a bit, a small lag. So six months or a year later, it just adjusted the price but to reflect the cost, and that was it. So B was very close to zero in practice. Now, over time, we have increased B. So we have, made, we have created high power incentives to some extent. And that has been the key to remedy the dismal cost performance of traditional regulation. However, theory and practice indicate some caveats regarding high power incentives. First, making the cost, the firm accountable for its cost performance also provides the firm with an incentive to scheme quality. So if you have to pay for your costs, you want to reduce this cost also by reducing quality. So if you want to introduce powerful incentives, you also have to increase the monitoring uh, of quality at the same time, it goes together. And you know, some regulators didn't understand that, and of course, that was bad. <laughs> you, may, you may imagine what happened. Second, the observation that powerful incentives generate both high effort and high profit um, implies that regulators cannot have their cake and eat it too. So the thing is that you don't have complete information, and the very efficient firms, those who are confident in their ability to control costs, are going to choose a fixed price contract or something like that, where they are going to keep most of the co cost decrease. But they might, you know, part of it is luck, of course. That means they will have rent, they will have high profits. So, you know, high power incentive schemes are very good at eliciting high effort, but at the same time, they leave high rents on the table. And, you know, again, regulators didn't understand that as a, at the start. They, they thought they could introduce high power incentives and at the same time have no profit. And, you know, it just doesn't work. 
And the point is that if you want really to your higher power incentive to be credible, what you have to do is to have commitment power. Because if you try under political pressure to capture the profit exposed, then if it's anticipated, of course, that destroys an incentive to exert effort because you know you won't get the profit out of exerting effort. Okay? So you really have to know this principle, otherwise there will be wishful thinking. You need commitment. The third point I want to make, and there are many other caveats to high power incentive, but uh, I just want to make it clear, is that the possibility of high rents increases the benefit for the firm of capturing its regulator. Actually, there's more in the world of price caps. You can show there is more stakes in capturing the regulator, having the regulator be nice to you, than in a world with cost plus, because cost plus there's not much stake. You just get reimbursed for your cost period. Okay, so if you cannot guarantee the regulator's independence from industry, or you don't have enough competition, which is the case in those industries, don't go for high-powered incentives. Second lesson is you should be very careful when tinkering with the price structure. The essence of regulation is often to ensure that undeserved market power doesn't translate into high overall prices. Overall prices. Traditionally so, regulators have gone way beyond the price level regulation, so trying to regulate prices down. They have also mingled with the ratio of prices, that is with the structure of prices. There too, they have a substantial information handicap, just like for the price level. But the need for intervention is much less obvious than in the case of a price level. It's pretty clear that the monopolist wants to charge high prices. It's not that clear that the monopolists want to have Bob rather than Anna bear the brunt of market power. In 1956, Marcel Boiteux, um, who then became later on the, the CEO of Electricité de France and did all the nuclear program uh, for France, was all, he was also, by the way, a president of the Economic Society. And he had a famous paper um, in which he was building on the work by Frank Ramsey. And he asked, how should a fixed infrastructure cost of a regulated firm be covered through markup? So the reason why you have a monopoly in the first place is usually, usually is that you have large fixed costs. You have this large fixed cost, it has to be recouped in some way. So you need markups above marginal costs. Okay? Boiteux showed that regulated firms should exhibit a price structure which is similar to that of ordinary unregulated firms. So in this equation that you have here, the price PI, so you, are, you have a multi-product firm, the price PI in segment I should be low if the segment is cheap to serve. I mean, no, no big surprise, so if the marginal cost on the segment CI is small, and if the segment has a high elasticity of demand, what I call here it I. So that's the inverse elasticity rule that you probably have seen in your studies. Uh, except for one thing, usually when you, when you learn things, this parameter theta is equal to one. Learner index is equal to the inverse elasticity of demand. But in the case of regulation, the whole thing, all I is to bring down the prices. And you bring them down in a kind of uniform way, if you want. So you use an elasticity-based rule. So you, you want to charge lower prices if the demand is very elastic to price, because you, want, you don't want to introduce distortions. But, uh, but you do it consistently, consistently across goods. Furthermore, you know, those are business-oriented prices. You, you'll, you'll find that surprising, because you, you have, you know, pure regulation, but it looks very much like a standard firm, a business, what, what, what CEOs and, uh, of, of ordinary firms do every day. They think about the elasticity of demand, you know, how many customers they're going to lose if they raise price. Right? It's exactly the same, except that you have this theta which is less than one. It has to be positive because if it were equal to zero, you will not be recouping the fixed cost. Okay. 
Now, furthermore, under some conditions, the regulatory problem decomposes. So the asymmetric information part, the trade-off between rents and cost-reducing effort, which I was talking about earlier, should be addressed solely through the cost or profit sharing rule. So you use a cost sharing rule or profit sharing rule so as to balance those two concerns that you don't want to leave big profits, but you also want to have cost-reducing effort. And pricing then should be obeying the Ramsey water rule. Okay? And this dichotomy actually has very important practical implication I'm going to come back to. Now in practice, if you look at the practice of regulation, regulators used to form regulated firms to set economically very inefficient price structures. This is not what they did. I can tell you this is completely different from what they did. Typically, utilities charge low prices on inelastic segments, such as monthly subscription fees to be connected to a power of te telecom networks, or and very high prices on elastic consumption, like long distance uh, phone calls. They also charge high prices to businesses and low prices to residential consumers. Even so, the businesses had more bypass opportunities. So we are more elastic. One justification for this was, of course, redistributive concerns, because you want to redistribute to world residential users and so on. But in the end, the cross subsidies the, through the price structure, the, the price structure was often a reverse Ramsey Water rule. Um, actually, um, there was no discussion. First, it favors some of the rich. Uh, so the rich also were benefiting from, from the wrong pricing structure, but also there was no question of whether you should uh, do redistribution in another way. I mean, there are more efficient ways of redistributing. You have the income tax and things like that. Why do you manipulate prices to redistribute? I mean, there's a huge literature on that, but uh, you know, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, do we really need prices to distort prices in order to, to redistribute? Okay. Now, the tinkering away from Ramsey Brother prices were also motivated by the correct observation that the regulator doesn't have quite the information uh, about this. So, so they may not know the cost, and they may not know uh, the elasticity of demand. And that's correct. But they completely forgot they could try to decentralize. After all, someone had this information, the firm itself, at least had some information. So why don't you delegate those decisions uh, to the thing? to the firm. Now, that was the idea of a price cap regulation. So a price cap regulation is a regulation in which you put a cap on some average price. Okay? But you, leave, you let the firm choose how to meet this constraint, how to satisfy this constraint. You just let the firm decide uh, on the individual prices. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but just to simplify, you just say your average price should be X and no more. And then you can choose, you know, is that Bob who should bear the brunt or is that Anna who should bear the brunt of recouping the fixed cost, okay? And this price cap has been used not only to increase the power of incentive scheme, as I said, but also to let the firm uh, use a more business-oriented uh, pricing structure. And that has implied quite a change the way the pricing was done. And that's linked with this dichotomy property uh, that actually under some condition you can basically separate the pricing which follows just standard principle and then use a cost reimbursement rule or the sharing the profit of share the, the sharing of profit in order to uh, to get what you want um, a special case of this idea arises where when the products are actually intermediate inputs um, and there uh, pricing at marginal cost is bad because then that, that will mean that uh, the cost recovery should go only to those segments which are non-competitive, and it's, it's a bad idea. I realize I'm running a little bit late. My principal is going to complain, but um, let me say a few things about two-sided markets. And a particular interesting choice of price structure arises in the so-called two-sided markets. So I don't know how much you know about two-sided markets. Uh, two-sided platforms that bring together multiple user communities that want to interact with each other. So gamers and game developers, 
users and application developers in the case of an operating system. In the case of a platform like Google, um, eyeballs, you and me, um, and advertisers, in case of American Express or Visa or PayPal or whatever, you want to have the merchants and the cardholders. You have to bring them on board. Now, interestingly, regardless of their market power, whether they are Google or free newspaper like Metro, it is Metro in the US, right? It's all over Europe. It's, you know, this free newspaper that you get at the, at the subway entrance, no? Well, what are the free newspapers in Chicago? Well, you know what I mean, OK? Uh, OK. They choose a platform, choose uh, to allocate a lower burden to the side, let's call it side I, whose presence benefits most users on the other side, side J. So in this equation, VJ represents how much side J users value an extra user on side I. This willingness to pay for an interaction with an extra user on side I can be recouped by the platform through a price increase on side J. So if you bring one more user on side I, that's going to benefit the user on side J. If they attach a value VJ to that, you can increase the price to them by VJ, and then you can recoup it, which means that it's almost the same formula as the Ramsey Water formula. It's unregulated, so here, instead of having theta, you have one. But the big difference is that instead of considering the cost, which C is going to be the platform cost per transaction, it may be zero, actually. It may cost nothing to the platform when you have a transaction uh, between the, um, the two sites. But the point is that the cost is an opportunity cost. So actually, when you think about the cost, that you're, the price that you're going to charge to, to side I, you have to take into account the fact that you're going to make a profit on side J. Okay? And this is, this is a kind of formula that you get. Um, like ordinary businesses, of course, you also take into account the inverse elasticity of, of demand, the elasticity of demand on, on side I when you price to side I, but that's nothing new. The new thing is that you know, your cost of supplying a consumer on side I actually has to be, is lower because you are going to make more money on side J if you bring one more consumer on side I. Now equation two, I mean, this equation, whatever it is, uh, is going to result in very skewed pricing pattern with possibly not, you know, one side paying nothing. So for example, you, have you ever wondered why you, you didn't pay for Google or search engine, a portal, a newspaper? Sometimes you are even paid, actually. That's one of the rare examples where you get negative prices in economics, but sometimes you're even paid to use a service. When you use your, your, your credit card, you may get cashback bonuses, you may get frequent flyer miles for a service which is, which is nice. So actually, you're even paid. But of course, there is no secret. Uh, you end up with uh, the other side being heavily taxed. So the, the simplest example is uh, the case of sponsored links, uh, advertising finance platforms, so the advertisers of course, put a high value uh, VJ on, on interacting with buyers, especially if the buyers are alumni of Chicago or the University of Chicago, because they are well to do. And the buyers may not care about, um, may not care about uh, having advertisers. They may even perceive that as being a nuisance. Um, and you get a very, pricing, a very skewed pricing pattern. Um, and you know, those are things that, now if you are a regulator and you don't understand what the two-sided market is, you are going to get it wrong. If you are an antitrust authority, because you are going to say, look, I mean, you, there's this very low price there. Actually, it's zero, it could be negative. That's, that's predation, right? This firm is trying to prey on the rivals. And in some countries, you could even say, oh, look at the very high price on that side. This is, you know, clear exercise of monopoly power. Even so, very small platform entrants practice exactly the same thing, same strategy. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, antitrust authorities should turn a blind eye when facing two-sided platforms. So let me give you an example of that. Imagine that you have a platform which supplies a service to its, to its members. So think about American Express. Basically, uh, the American Express cardholders get this service out of that. Or your, you know, booking, booking.com might uh, actually uh, perform a service on, you know, on behalf for, for, for the customer who goes on to booking. 
Now, the platform will actually get a merchant fee. It has various names, but think of that as being a merchant fee. So actually, you know, you may be uh, paying two or three percent, you know, of, of the price to American Express if the consumer has paid with an American Express card. For booking, it may be much higher, actually. It can be 10, 20 percent. You know, if you, if you reserve an hotel room through booking, it can be much higher. And I'm not talking about coupon, but, you know, it's, it can be very, very big. Now, the basic issue there is that there are other ways in general to reach a merchant. So, for example, in the case of credit cards, you don't have to pay with American Express. You can pay by cash, by check, by, through a Visa card. Um, and in the case of booking, you could call the hotel directly or you could do something like that. Now, those platforms almost always require price coherence from the merchant. So if you want to be affiliated with us, you have to charge the same price, you know, whether you, you know, there is a booking from us or a transaction through us or a transaction through other means. So you are not allowed to surcharge. Okay. Now, price coherence, coherence has sound justification. Actually, it prevents surcharging old ups. You may have encountered some. Uh, from the merchant. So in a sense, you, you don't get bad surprises through a surcharging at the last minute by the merchant. But it also comes with hazard. And basically, if you have a high merchant fee, the problem is that if you have price current, part of this merchant fee will be passed through to platform non-user because you are practicing the same price. So the merchant fee raises the overall cost to the merchant and this is going to be passed through in part to the non-users. So they are actually an externality on non-users. Okay? Actually, that's something not for booking, but I've done some work on, uh, with Jean-Charles Rocher on that. And others have done some work. Actually, this Edelman Wright paper is now published in QJE. Um, the, we did that for, uh, for the, um, the case of, um, of payment cards. And basically, we, we said the merchant fee should obey a Pigovian principle, so following Pigou. Um, the merchant fee should be equal to the benefit that the merchant derives from a card payment. The consumer decides on the payment method, can pay by card or by cash or whatever. But if the merchant fee is equal to the um, benefit for, for, the, um, for the merchant of uh, of using a card, I mean, there are several benefits, then there will not be any externality. So it's a Pigovian principle. And that rule actually has been adopted by the European Commission as its official doctrine to regulate Visa or MasterCard. Now, in this realm, as in many others, neither laissez faire nor a shotgun regulatory approach is warranted. You need some sound economic analysis. So you just stop me. OK. Sorry. You made a mistake here. <laughs> you made a big mistake. No, no, I'll try to be reasonable. Uh, let me talk a little bit about intellectual property, and that will be my last item. I told you at the start that the rule of reason approach requires some confidence as to which of efficiency and anti-competitive effects dominates. And you like to have simple rules, rules that do not rely on lots of information that is unlikely to be held by regulators or antitrust societies. So in the case of IP, the shortage of data actually can be quite severe because the technologies may not have yet hit the ground. And one of the current issues we are facing today is called patent secret or royalty stacking. Okay? If you are in an industry like biotechnology or software and you are a user or an implementer, in general, you will have to uh, acquire licenses to many patents, not one, but you know, many patents. And of course, there is a danger of royalty stacking, or we economists call that multiple marginalizations, so that you basically um, will, um, will have to pay multiple gatekeepers. If you want to understand royalty stacking, which, by the way, was formalized brilliantly by um, Cournot in 1838. So Cournot had anticipated everything, and more recently by Carl Shapiro 15 years ago. It may be useful to go back to the Middle Ages. So 
you are in Europe in the Middle Ages and you wanted to take a river because that was a convenient way of transporting goods and then you had to pay tolls along the rivers. Now do you know how many tolls there were on the Rhine River in the 14th century? 64. So that means that you had 64 monopolies. And of course you will not go all the way in the Rhine River, but you took, you took the Elbe and the Seine and the Garonne and all the rivers in Europe were the same. So you had multiple marginalization and you, you may imagine that uh, um, that was not very good for river traffic. Okay? It's, and monopoly is much worse than one monopoly. Okay? Now, Europe had to wait until the 19th century, actually the Congress of Vienna in 1815, to see uh, the removal of toll, toll stacking. It was not royalty stacking, it was toll stacking. Now, high technologies are currently witnesses an evolution toward more affordable prices similar to that for river traffic in the 19th century. New guidelines have been set so as to encourage the co-marketing of intellectual properties through what's called a patent pool. Okay? What is a patent pool? I have a confession to make. When I grew up as a student of industry organization, I never learned and didn't know what a patent pool was, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So I have no clue what a patent pool is. A patent pool is simply joint marketing. So you and I have two patents which are relevant to a technology. Instead of each having a tax on the end user through monopoly pricing, we decide to get um, to market it jointly through a special purpose vehicle, and then we get the dividends. So we pull our patents, we market at some agreed upon price, and then we get the dividends. Okay? Now, the idea of that, and you can see it from this figure, those toll collectors, they will be much better off actually if they could agree on a single price instead of exerting negative externality on each other. Because when this guy, for example, raises his price, it doesn't take into account not only that the users uh, will, be more in, will be in trouble, but also that the other, there will be less traffic, so there's a negative externality on the other toll collectors. Okay? So in that case, which is a case of complements, they are complementary products, uh, actually getting together not, is going to reduce price and is going to increase profits. It's a wonderful thing. You get more, pro more profit for the industry and you, you basically have re reduced price for the end user. Now, unfortunately, patent pools and more generally co-marketing arrangements may also allow firms to raise price. For example, the owners of two substitute patents. So you and I have patents which basically are both valid, but they do the same thing. So they are rival patents. You don't need two, you need only one. Um, like the toll collectors on the two river branches here in this diagram, so you can go north or you can go south, but it's the same to you as a user. Um, but of course, if they start a co-marketing arrangement, instead of competing à la Bertrand, so competing out with each other, they are going to raise a price to monopoly price, so it's called cartelization, it's a merger to monopoly. And that, obviously, you don't want to have. Okay? Now, let me have a little flashback. I like to go back in history. So, you have to know that prior to 1945, most of the high-tech high industries of the time were organized around patent pools. So, you look at chemicals, railroads, airplanes, TV, radio, cars, those were the advanced technologies of the time. They were run by patent pools. So, basically, patents which were pulled together among competitors and licensed together. Now, what happened in 1945? Well, in 1945, the Supreme Court of the U.S. decided that this was the worst possible thing on earth, and uh, that was you should not have patent pools anymore. Now, a few economists, uh, mainly from Berkeley, uh, in the 90s lobbied to have actually uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice, to allow patent pools again. So you have had a revival in the last 15, 20 years, mainly in information technology. You have lots of patent pools in your pocket, I can tell you. If you have an iPhone in your pocket, you have zillions of patent pools in your pocket. Okay? All the compression algorithm and the like are run by patent pools. But in between, of course, at least when I grew up as an economist, 
Nobody was interested in pad and pulse. It has disappeared. And nobody has worked. Now, you're going to say, why don't we just allow pad and pulse which lower price, and so maybe when the patents are complements, and disallow patent pools which raise price, that's the case when patents are substitute. The problem is that, in general, there are never perfect complements or perfect substitutes, and that depends on the usage and so on and so forth. The problem, again, is that the antitrust authorities don't have the required information. Okay? They could do econometrics, but very often those are new, new things, so you don't have data uh, to, to, to try to figure out whether they are complement or substitutes. So what do you do? Well, I'm going to argue that simple regulation can allow some sorting. And the first such regulation is called individual licensing. So individual licensing is you and I are pulling our patents into a pool, selling the bundle at some uh, price, capital P star, and then we share the dividends. But we keep ownership of our patent, so I can sell my own uh, patent at price P1. Uh, you can sell your own patent at price P2, your license, license, not to patent itself. So you can sell the license at the price if you want. Now, in the case of perfect substitutes, that's very simple because you'll say, well, then instead of getting, say, let's, uh, let's assume it's a merger to monopoly, instead of getting the monopoly profit, divided by two because there are two, two owners, I can get everything for myself. Just undercut the pool a little bit because there are substitutes. You don't, you don't need two. The users don't need two licenses, just need one. And you have recreated competition in this way. Okay? And that's actually a much more general result, which is that you take any subset of patterns with any complicated pattern of substitutability and, and, and complementarity across the patterns, if you add individual licensing, you are actually going to restore competition when the price will have been increased by the pool and not do anything and allow price reduction basically when, when the price should be decreased by a pool. Okay? Now, you know, the reasoning I gave you just uh, let's take the case of substitute pattern, which is a completely trivial case is that I don't want to share the dividend with you, so I'm going to undercut the pool, uh, and there will be Bertrand competition. So in the end, it's as if there was no pool. We're going to compete in individual licensing. Um, but you can say, well, what about tacit collusion? So it's a repeated game, so if I undercut you, maybe you will undercut tomorrow, and that's going to start a price war. Um, and then we need something else, okay? And if you want to be, by the way, something I want to insist on, individual licensing requires no information whatsoever. That's a regulatory rule that you can give, accept pools which have individual licensing, which allows their members to engage in individual licensing. It requires absolutely no information whatsoever. So that's good because that's information that the regulators will not have anyway. Um, now, about tacit collusion, what you want to do is to append another information-free requirement, which is called unbundling, which is very simple. So not only you're going to sell the bundle, but you ask the pool actually to, to sell at a price which is um, individual prices. So you, you have to unbundle um, the elements. You can still agree on, on prices. That's the important thing. If you want to reduce a price, in the case of complements, you have to do that, but you unbundle. And under these conditions, actually, again, if you have individual licensing plus unbundling, even if there is tacit collusion, a pool is always increasing, always increases welfare. Okay? It, it lowers price. Okay? Now, those two precepts derived from theory, independent licensing and unbundling, have, in, have been incorporated in European guidelines, for example, the first in 2004 and the second in 2014. Okay. The U.S. Department of Justice had already required independent licensing in a business review letters in the late 90s. So that shows the power of economic theory because you can use that and actually implement that uh, at the regulatory level. Just a last thing before I conclude, um, something that uh, I feel is very important also in, in the area of IP 
is what's called solar essential panels. So when you form a standard, that's basically you want everybody to use the same kind of, uh, of technology, right? You want to coordinate because you want to interoperate. The problem with standards is that ex ante, before the standard is set, there might be multiple ways of doing something. There might be two alternative routes which deliver the same results, those two routes being equivalent. They are kind of substitute. But ex post, when you have chosen a particular solution, technological solution, then you have made the owner of the patent which reads on this solution a monopoly. So ex ante, before the standard is set, you may have competitive solutions, which are equivalent in terms of value for the users, but ex post, uh, once you have been chosen, you become a monopolist and you can ask any price. You can ask for a monopoly price. And in practice, it's dealt with a concept I love, which is called friend. Friend is when you go to a standard setting organization, you say, look, if my patent is covered by the standard, is selected by the standard setting organization, or I should say the functionality that my patent reads on is selected by the standard setting organization, I promise that I will charge a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory price. Now, what is reasonable? God knows. And actually, what happens right now is that there are million, multi-million dollar lawsuits in all over the world, many of them you know, between Microsoft and Google and Apple and Samsung, everybody's suing each other. You said you'll be reasonable. Now, it's great for, for lawyers and economists, but it's not that great for society. So, um, w w you know, w what we have proposed actually from the, from the theory, it's a paper coming out in JP, I mean, what we have proposed is simply, why don't we have ex ante commitments? So you say, you know, if my, if my, um, Pattern is chosen as part of, I promise I won't license it at a price above this price cap that I'm setting for myself. And then you know what you are buying. If you have a standard setting organization, you know what you are buying. I mean, you will, will you buy a house without having bought a land before? You know, because that will be terrible. You'll be held up. Same thing, when you enact a standard, you create a huge amount of monetary power, which is not necessarily deserved. And therefore, you want to ask people to uh, to commit to prices ex ante before the standard is set. And that's something that actually exists in one or two standard setting organizations, but in the paper we explain why it's not a market solution in practice. So you, you do need regulation there. So let me, let me conclude by saying that the theory of industrial organization has proved a very useful, I mean, it's very biased, very biased uh, statement, of course, but I, I think it has proved a very useful uh, tool to think about one of the major challenges of the economy because it has fashioned, uh, fashioned antitrust and regulation, recognizing that basically industries are different from each other, one size doesn't fit all. I think this body of knowledge uh, has been built patiently to help regulators and uh, to better understand market power and the effects of policy intervention, and also to firms to formulate their business strategies. So, you know, now you have consulting firms which work around the concept of uh, two-sided markets, how you should build a new two-sided markets in, in AI technology and, and so on. Now, I think industrial organization has gone a long way, but much work remains to be done. Actually, the exciting thing is that lots of good young people, top young researchers actually do, doing interesting work in this area. Now, my view is that economists are about making this world a better place. And I think this community of industrial organization economists has contributed to that. At least that's what I want to believe. And you know, as I said, it's not my price. I think it's the price of all community. And you know, I was very, very happy to receive the price on, the, on behalf of that community. Thank you very much. So I think we have time for just a couple of questions, if there's some questions from the audience. This is a, a question regarding um, two sided markets, in particular, debit and credit credit card payment systems. Um, I want to know your opinion regarding an, an industry arrangement in the country where I'm, I'm coming from. We have uh, one system in which there is one acquirer, um, which is owned by the banks, 
and then the uh, the top merchant fee that we have is as high as 3% uh, for credit card uh, transactions and half of that for debit card tra transactions. So this seems to be very high from an international uh, perspective and probably far away from the Pigubium solution. What would you recommend the regulator to do in order to <laughs> increase this? I, I, it's getting, just for those of you who don't know, an acquire is a merchant's bank. So you have an issuer, which is your bank, when you have a credit card or debit card, and the acquirer is uh, the merchant's bank. Now in some countries, and I don't know where you come from, but in some countries you have only one acquirer. Uh, in many countries, you have actually quite a, a lot of competitions. Now, the, the issue is, uh, with uh, the merchant fee in general, of course, there might be some uh, monopoly power issue, and then that's an antitrust issue, which is very classical. So if you think that this acquires charging too much money, of course, it being vertically integrated with bank, of course, reduces the, the incentive to, uh, to, do a bad, to do a poor performance. But um, the main issue which was raised in antitrust all over the world is what's called the interchange fee. Okay, so what is the interchange fee? is just an access price. Okay, when, when you pay at a merchant, the merchant bank um, is going to pay uh, a merchant, I'm sorry, it's going to charge a merchant fee, but part of this merchant fee comes from an interchange fee that the merchant bank has to pay to your bank. And actually, this interchange fee can be high, which is a reason actually why you have a free credit card or free debit card and you get those frequent flyer miles on top of that. Because your bank gets an interchange fee. It's just, it's just a transfer between the merchant bank and your bank. And most antitrust authorities all over the world have said, no, no, those interchange fees are too high. And first I've said something I found completely crazy, which is I've said, you know, if you think about Visa and MasterCard, those are, they used to be association, now they are for profit, but they have like six or 7,000 members. And they said, it's price fixing, okay, price fixing. The interchange fee, that's true, it's, there is one interchange fee, but basically they say it's a collusion among the banks to fix a price. Now, just imagine what would happen if you had a matrix of 6,000 or by 6,000 with different interchange fees when you go shopping. <laughs> you know, this, this, you know, basically this card is not accepted at the merchant and so on. I mean, this will be a complete mess. And anyway, it's not a price level thing, it's a price structure thing. I mean, people confuse a price level issue with a price structure issue because basically when you raise interchange fees, that means that the merchant will pay more and you will pay less. Okay, that's what it means. So it's not, it's not market power in the standard sense of raising all prices. It's actually subsidizing consumers and taxing merchants. Now you can say it's good or it's bad, but it's a price structure issue. It's not a, a price level issue. Now, what we, what we have shown in our research is that for two reasons, it may be the case that this uh, interchange fee will be chosen too high by the associations like Visa and MasterCard. And that's why we came up with a regulatory rule, which is now the European rule in the matter, uh, this kind of Pigovian principle. Um, but there, I mean, I, I'm not commenting on whether they compute things right or wrong, and I was not involved in that, but uh, on the, we have the theoretical principle to at least have a benchmark. Now, what I found strange, then, is that the antitrust authorities just think that Visa and MasterCard, which are open systems, actually must be regulated because they collude on one price. But if you take Google Wallet or American Express or, or PayPal or whatever, those are what's called closed systems. So the merchant bank is exactly the same as your bank because there is only one, which is American Express or PayPal. There's only one party. So there is no price fixing. The interchange fee is implicit. Is, there is no real interchange. What matters is the merchant fee in the end. So the weird thing is that the antitrust authorities haven't, I'm being a bit nasty because that's not quite true, but they haven't understood that closed system have the same issues as the open system. And you should have a level playing field across uh, different ways of payments. So that's, 
that, that the thing. It's a long answer. <laughs> I have one more question. I wanted, to ask about, I wanted to ask about another area you've been involved in with research, which is uh, corporate governance. Uh, there's been some recent research that suggests that large amounts of ownership by groups of institutional investors, so the same mutual funds owning large chunks of firms in the same industry, has led to some amount of price collusion and oligopolistic behavior. I mean, what do you think of that? Is there a governance kind of thing? I, it's, it's a very old, I mean, I have no particular view on that uh, because I haven't thought about it, but it's an old issue, which is that if you have common ownership of firms that otherwise may compete in the market, this common ownership, I mean, that is back to the Sherman Act. And, you know, then possibly it could be, it all depends how much influence uh, those shareholders have in the management. You know, if they are small ones, they have no power. And, you know, they are one person, maybe it doesn't matter. But it, if they start being a block and they, they can be very active and you know, they, they fire the management of one firm because it's competing, this manager is competing too hard with the rivals they also own, then you know, it's, it's like a cartel. So uh, this is really an empirical matter and you know, I don't have an answer because you really have to measure whether it's effective or not this, this time. But you know, in theory, yes, that, that could be bad. Okay, I would, uh, we will adjourn now to informal conversation and that's in Solarium. I'd like to thank Jean one more time. So. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>